This is Lisa Elwine. Welcome to our series called More Than. We're looking at all sorts of things from scripture that, yeah, they mean what they mean and they are what they are, but there's more than what they are. And sometimes we haven't really investigated what more they might be. Now, most people are familiar with the ram's horn, the shofar, uh, but not everybody really understands the significance of it. It doesn't mean lots of people don't enjoy blowing it, but sometimes we're using a shofar and we don't know everything that it represents. And if we find out what it represents, how it's used in scripture to symbolize very important, fundamental uh, foundations of our faith, I think we can get even more enjoyment out of blowing that shofar. So what is it? What is a shofar? Well, obviously it's more than a horn. It's much more than a horn, but it is a horn. It's an animal horn. And so it might be a ram's horn, something like this. They have some that are even smaller than this one right here. You know, they might even just be around that size. Uh, the size will probably affect the tone. And so uh, whether you get a ram's horn, something smaller like this, or whether you get something much larger. You've seen some much larger examples. In fact, if I were holding one, uh, it probably wouldn't even be in the screenshot. But antelopes have particularly, um, what is the plural of antelope? Is it antelope or antelopes? You need to look that up for me. But antelope often have long horns like a, uh, a kudu. A kudu is a particular uh, type of antelope that's native to Africa. And they have these most beautiful, long, curled horns. And they make the most wonderful, resonant sounds. Uh, so whether you like the big, long kudu horn, or whether you like the little ram's horn, or whether you're picking something in between, there's all sorts of things out there. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's really a matter of personal taste. What's really important is the tone that comes out, that it be pleasing to your ears so that you would actually enjoy blowing it. There's another name for the horn or the, the shofar, and that's called the yovel. And if we're looking at the ram's horn, that has a, a real specific identity as the, the yovel. And you might be familiar with yovel from an English word, jubilee. Jubilee. It's the year of freedom, right? So yovel is an equivalent expression to a shofar, particularly a ram's horn. So there is an element of blowing the ram's horn or the shofar or the yovel, whatever you're comfortable using, that represents freedom. And like we said, each horn, because it belongs to a unique animal, it's going to have its own unique horn. And a lot of people buy their shofar sight unseen. They might buy them online and have them shipped to them. And then it arrives and you may or may not be pleased with the, the tone of the horn. One little secret I found when I was in Israel, if you're going to buy a shofar, make friends with the person that's selling the shofar. Because most Israeli sellers of shofars, if you just ask nicely, they're willing to try it out for you. They're willing to, to pick up multiple shofars and blow them until they find one with a really pleasing tone and select that one for you. I'm sure it's because so many people don't care or don't even know to ask, could you pick me out a nice one? Could you pick me out one that has a beautiful tone to it? Uh, so don't be afraid to ask that. As long as you ask it nicely, they probably will pick out a good one for you and ship that one to you. Now, if you happen to go to a conference where they're selling shofars, like say Revive, then you'll have the opportunity to pick up that shofar and try it out to see if that tone is pleasant to you. Just be respectful of the people around you because you know they may not all want to hear the shofar at that particular moment. Uh, uh, I don't guess they have a lot of phone booths still left over from the, the good old days, but to me, that would be perfect. If you, you and the shofar could fit in there together, you could blow to your heart's content, and it, it wouldn't you know, 
produce any problems with your neighbors. But, you know, a conference is a great place to buy a shofar because you can pick it up and try it out. Or you say, well, wait a minute, I don't even know how to blow this yet. You know what? Probably, again, the person selling it might try it out for you so you can hear how it sounds. And there's always going to be someone hanging around that shofar table that'll be willing to blow it for you. You can count on that. But try it out if you can, if it's possible. Listen to the tone so that you'll be happy with it. Because like I said, every shofar is different, just like every animal is different. And that's one thing, too, that we need to look at. This horn was originally attached to a living animal. And so with living animals come particular odors, right? Um, and so when you receive your shofar, you might smell something that, that's a little bit like a dead animal smell. It may not be that pleasant. Um, I would compare it to a, a horse's hoof. You know, if, if you've ever had horses and, and trimmed a horse's hoof, it's not that pleasant. Um, but there's things that you can do that'll kind of pull that odor out of there. You can go online. I'm sure you can YouTube it or whatever, and you'll find different suggestions. Um, some people will say, do these salt treatments with it. Uh, I've, I've seen one thing where they kind of, they pour aquarium gravel into the horn, and then they'll plug up both ends, kind of shake it up really good, but leave it plugged up and just let it sit there for a few days. And uh, the, the gravel, the aquarium gravel, now not sharp gravel, right? Um, you know, you, you don't want to do damage to the interior of the horn, but um, that aquarium gravel apparently will tend to soak up the odor. And then after a few days or a week or so, you can empty it back out and see if it smells any better. You can also use rinses of hydrogen peroxide. White vinegar is a, a nat very natural thing to use. Uh, baking soda and water rinses, again, kind of plug up the holes on each end and shake it a little bit and see if that improves some of that strong animal odor. Uh, maybe this is one reason, of course, it's associated with uh, the trumpet of resurrection because as you're blowing a shofar and you get a whiff of that shofar, you definitely get the feeling, I, I need a resurrection from the dead right here because uh, the dead animal didn't leave a great odor behind. Uh, but again, what does it represent? In a nutshell, repentance. And we'll start out and look at some simpler aspects of what the shofar symbolizes. And then maybe we can go into some of the more mysterious elements, which they're not really that mysterious at all. It's just that often the principles are embedded within the scriptures in Hebrew, just like the shofar blasts. We know that there's four particular shofar blasts. Not every know, everybody, not everybody knows what they mean. And so if you know what even the name of that blast means, then it deepens your understanding of what you're doing when you blow that particular blast on the shofar. So the context of scripture can unlock some of these mysteries. Just learning some Hebrew words like yovel, freedom, jubilee, release, um, returning to inheritance. If you just know that about it, that it's also called the yovel, that's a new layer of understanding. And I think a new layer of joy as you're blowing the shofar. Or remember, you don't have to know how to blow this shofar. The commandment is to hear the voice of the shofar. So you just need to know somebody who can blow it if you can't blow it. And the listening is the commandment. So in a nutshell, repentance. When we hear the shofar, it's calling us to repentance. There's some other uh, purposes for the shofar, but I think this is probably the most important one, uh, especially as it concerns our um, looking forward to the resurrection. Now, when you buy a shofar, like I said, you can get this little ram's horn, an even smaller ram's horn, or a big kudu horn. But the important thing is, again, what it represents. And so if this represents repentance, one of the principles that Jews look for is, is the horn curved? 
is there a curve in the, because certain antelope, if you buy it, it's, they have more of a straight up and down horn, kind of like a unicorn horn. Um, and those are okay. If that's what you have, it's still accomplishing the same purpose. This has more to do with the symbolism of it. How is it seen? Well, with the curved horn, of course, this represents the bending in repentance to the call of the Holy One. He's calling out to us. And so we want to bow. We want to bend our will to his will. And so as you're, you're picking up your shofar, you can say, well, this, you know, this one has a really nice curve in it. Some of them, it's just a little more gentle curve. Doesn't really matter. But as you're looking at that curve, then you can kind of think in the back of your mind, yes, this is a call to repentance. And as I blow this shofar, we want everybody who hears it to be able to bend uh, to the will of the Holy One. And if there's something that needs to change, then, then we can turn back. We can turn our own will to adjust to His. We don't turn His will to ours, but ours to His. So in Scripture, how do we see the shofar? Well, a lot of times the, the blowing of the shofar is associated with times that the silver trumpets would blow. And obviously this is not a silver trumpet. This is an animal horn. This is a shofar. This is a yovel. It's different from a silver trumpet that Moses was commanded to make. And uh, the trumpets are called chatzrot rot. Chatzot rot. Chatzot rot. That's a lot of tzadis in one word. Chatzot rot. Okay, that would be plural, trumpets. Uh, and we know that the scripture tells us to blow the trumpets over the, the new months. You're going to have a new moon at the beginning of the month. So you're going to blow the silver trumpet there. You're going to blow it for the feasts. You're going to blow for uh, camp movements. You're going to blow to call the leadership assembly. You're going to blow for war. You know, assembling for war and moving in war. Um, the ram's horn is not obviously a silver trumpet. It's a yovel. And again, um, there's going to be a context. We're going to look at, well, if the scripture says we should be blowing two silver trumpets, then why are people blowing a shofar on that same occasion? We'll find out. There's a reason why. You just, again, you have to kind of go back into the scripture and you might have to use your concordance if you can't read the Hebrew words so that you can hear the wording of the scripture and understand that, sure, the silver trumpets were bl blown at these special occasions, but we find out that in practice, the shofar was blown with the silver trumpets. And we think this possibly goes back to Mount Sinai, where at the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, of course, Israel is all assembled at the foot of Mount Sinai. They've all been called there to participate in the receiving of the covenant that Adonai offered them. And it was at this particular Shavuot or Pentecost when the whole nation heard the sound of the shofar. They heard the sound specifically of the Yovel. It's called Yovel in that, that context. Uh, just like when Joshua is circling the, the city of Jericho and they're blowing trumpets, it talks about the, the Yovel. Because um, one aspect, when you blow a shofar, um, one of the descriptions of this process is avar. It, it kind of, the sound of it crosses avar. And Avar, of course, is the root of a word you know very well, Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's ivri, from avar, one who has crossed over from death to life. So if it describes the blowing of the shofar, then there is some quality of the shofar that's teaching us how we will cross, or avar, from death to life. So... At this particular feast, the Feast of Shavuot at Mount Sinai, we know the children of Israel were going to receive the Ten Commandments. 
How did they receive it? To the sound of the shofar. So at that point, I think in biblical history, we can see that the seed of what we're to understand is contained within the blowing of the yovel or the shofar. Um, the silver trumpets will add an extra element, but ultimately we blow them together if we have the silver trumpets. Not everybody has silver trumpets. If you do, you know, koha kavod. But if all you have is the yovel or the ram's horn, you have enough here because you have the original shofar of the Ten Commandments. Um, and that's a beautiful thought that just as the children of Israel are gathered at Mount Sinai. Um, I think this is the point where they can kind of breathe easy. They've escaped Pharaoh, and now they've come to the mountain of Adonai. They know they're about to enter into covenant with him. And so that's, I think, when they can truly sense their freedom from bondage in Egypt. Uh, they thought they were free from bondage, and if if you find out these chariots are chasing them down, well, okay, now I don't feel that free anymore because somebody's chasing me. I'm not free until they quit chasing me, right? And so they come to Mount Sinai and it's kind of like, whew, yeah, he's destroyed my enemies and he's releasing me into the journey before me where he's going to take me into the promised land. So the, the Yovel at Mount Sinai suggests that sense of freedom and relief that we have, that we're no longer in bondage. And it's particularly important, you know, at Passover to think about the Yovel because it does represent the Jubilee and freedom from bondage. And of course, the Hebrew slaves being freed from their bondage. And it's believed that the, the Hebrews went out in a jubilee year, a yovel year. And therefore, that um, the feast, which most of them revolve around a remembrance of coming out of Egypt, that sense of liberty and the yovel is always associated with the blowing of the ram's horn, the yovel. Uh, one tradition, too, is not just that it was a jubilee that the Hebrews went out of Egypt, but that Joseph, even before that, he was released from prison on the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. So uh, if so, that would certainly be a, a sign of the, the prisoner going free, experiencing that personal jubilee. And for Joseph, of course, that personal jubilee led to um, safety for his family. Um, another time the shofar is blown at a feast is going to be at not just the Feast of Trumpets, which is also known as Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, the day of the awakening blast, the day and the hour that no man knows, the hidden day. It has lots of nicknames. But 10 days later, there's another feast where we don't eat. We feast on the word on that day. And that's Yom HaKippurim. Yom HaKippurim. It's not really Yom Kippur. We say Yom Kippur for short, but it's Yom HaKippurim because there's many atonements on that day. Uh, when they would proclaim the Jubilee year or the Yovel year, of course, they're going to use the Yovel. They're going to use the lamb horn, ram's horn, and they're going to use it on Yom HaKippurim. So they will blow this shofar, this yovel, on Yom HaKippurim to proclaim freedom to the, the Hebrew servant. Any Hebrew servant who has been serving another, um, they, they function kind of like indentured servants if they got into debt or if they got into to trouble with the law. And uh, in order to work off their sentence, their services were sold to a certain person for a certain number of years. But on the Jubilee, it didn't matter how many years you had served. Every Hebrew servant had to go free in that Jubilee. Of course, that's what the shofar represents. It's freedom. It's the release of the soul, the release of the captive soul, and the start of a new life. Just like leaving Egypt. Just like arriving at Mount Sinai. Just like Yom HaKippurim. 
returning to our inheritance, leaving a, a bondage to return to the inheritance. And in fact, even that lifetime servant, remember in uh, one of the Torah portions, there's a little blurb there is like, if you've got a, a servant, which he's actually an employee, and that's, that's a better modern word to use, if he's worked off his debt and he doesn't want to leave that particular employer, he can say, I don't want to leave. I've, I've made a life here. I want to stay. He can stay. He can have his ear pierced and as a sign that he wants to stay. But in the Jubilee year, whether he wants to or not, he must go back to his inheritance. Uh, he must embrace his freedom at that point. Uh, but of course, the best known feast, the one everybody knows about, is going to be the Feast of Trumpets. Um, when we blow the Yovel on the Feast of Trumpets, again, it's a sign of repentance, that repentant soul. It's being released from its imprisonment within the confines of the physical body. And you're starting a new life. There's lots of controversy about whether Rosh Hashanah is actually the new year. We can address that. Um, because in scripture, sometimes it'll give you two things that appear to be contradictory to one another. But as you study the, the Hebrew text and so forth, what you'll find out is they actually work together. So there's no conflict with uh, scripture calling the Feast of Trumpets the turn of the year the going out of the year, and then proclaiming the year of Jubilee 10 days, 10 days later at Yom Kippur. There's no conflict with that. And the month of Passover being the first of the month. Uh, difficult for some people, if you're locked in an either-or mindset, it's very difficult to lock your mind onto it. But in Scripture, it just assumes you're going to be okay with His way. And that's what we, we want to be okay with His way. And so if he says it's the turn of the year and the going out of the year, then, then we're good with making a turn right then too. And understanding that just as there's renewal at Passover, there's going to be renewal again in the fall feasts. So we hear that shofar at the Feast of Trumpets, and we're ready to start a new year of life at that point. It's believed that um, on that particular day of the year, that all the decrees pertaining to a person's life are written down. It's decided who will live, who will die. It's decided which obstacles you will have to, to surmount to, to walk in your faith, to improve your faith. And um, so you start saying at that time to one another, may your name be inscribed and sealed in the book of life because the new year for that begins at that point. So as you hear that shofar, again, you realize you're being released from the confines of last year, and now you're starting onto a new path in the, the coming year. I would guess, though, if there were things that you just refused to deal with last year, they might be back on your list this year. Just thinking aloud there. Uh, but as we look at the Feast of Trumpets, yes, you're going to hear the blowing of the Yovel in the Fall Feast. But again, those feasts are in remembrance of when you came out of Egypt. So the beginning of the months, of course, is going to be the month of Pesach, or Passover. That's new life, too. It's life from the dead. It's, it's coming out of Egypt, which represents the realm of the dead. And so there, there had to be a marking of the beginning of the month because Moses, that's the first thing Moses tells the people about their new life. He says, this is going to be the beginning of the month for you. He's, you know, the Holy One's putting you on his calendar now. You're not going to be on the Egyptian calendar anymore. You're going to be on your calendar and that's going to be his calendar. So he marked that new life again by resetting their calendar so we have the trumpets, um, we have the shofar that are blown over these new beginnings. Each month's beginning will be marked by the trumpets and the shofar. Um, going back to that first of the month of Nisan, the week of Passover, where they knew everything had changed on the first of the month. 
Then they would take their lamb on the 10th of the month, and then they would slaughter their lamb, and then they would have the week of unleavened bread. It it laid down the pattern for how they would observe Passover forever after, right? Because it's it's for all generations. Uh, So what we want to do, if we say, okay, we know that the, the shofar is going to be important at the season of Passover because we have to proclaim the beginning of the month to know when to observe Passover. It's also going to be important in the fall feast because if we don't know when to blow the shofar, it's actually going to be blown for two days at the Feast of Trumpets. It's, it's written because of doubt, inciting the, the new moon in ancient times. At this point in history, we have a calendar that, that tells us what the days are. Um, in Israel, the Sanhedrin is, is working into that, that ancient method of using both the calendar and eyewitnesses, uh, which is exciting. You know, we had to give them some time to get their feet under them in the land, but they're beginning to introduce some changes that I think are going to be important eventually. Uh, but if it's important at Passover in the, the spring feast, if it's important in the fall, and the fall feast, then we have to look back to the middle. That would be Shavuot or Pentecost. It's, it sits in the middle. It's the axis. If you visualize it on the menorah, it sits right there in the middle, the fourth feasts, when the children of Israel receive the Ten Commandments. And that's the guideline. We're going to go back to when they, they hear the Yovel. Now, there's going to be something that happened before that that makes them familiar with why the Yovel is important, or the Shofar. But at Mount Sinai, that particular experience is, I think, going to define for us why, again, not just the silver trumpets are going to be blown for these special occasions, but it's also going to be the Shofar, the Yovel, that's blown along with it. All right. So let's look at Exodus 19, 10 through 14. The Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. This should sound familiar from the message to the seven assemblies of Revelation, right? Because each of those assemblies corresponds to one of the seven feasts. He says, let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And that's important, in the sight of all the people. This shofar is to be heard by large numbers of people. It's, it's a group event, so to speak. He says, you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. Uh, When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. He says, this is going to be the signal. You're going to hear this yobel. You're going to hear this ram's horn. And when you hear the long blast on the ram's horn, then they can come up to the mountain. So it says, Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. So here's an interesting parallel. Of course, the shofar is associated with Passover and coming out of Egypt, a type of resurrection. Well, in this particular case, he picks up that symbol of resurrection by saying it's going to be on the third day. That shofar is going to be sounded on the third day. He's telling them, you're about to have another kind of resurrection. You say, well, how many resurrections are there? More than one. More than one resurrection, because each of these feasts teaches us a different aspect of resurrection in our preparation for this resurrection. So we know that. That's established. Three is the number of resurrection in the Word. So even though they're approaching to hear the ram's horn on the fourth feast, he's still pointing them back to the number three so they won't forget that this experience that they're about to have with the commandments pertains to life from the dead. It pertains to the resurrection. 
So we can see now uh, how the shofar, it does teach us about Passover and the, the liberty and proclaiming freedom from bondage. It takes us to Shavuot. Again, it's associated with the third day, resurrection and freedom from bondage. And that's what post, most people get backward. They think the commandments of Adonai are bondage, but we want to be free. And the Holy One is saying just the opposite. He says, this is the perfect Torah of liberty. This is where you are free. Your perception of freedom is wrong. And so when you hear the, the ram's horn, then your perception of his commandments as his teaching and instructions, you'll instead begin to change your position. So you've got to bend it, right? you got to bend when you hear this sound. You've got to bend when you hear his teaching and instructions. And if he says his teaching and instruction is freedom and your way is bondage, you have to believe him. You have to bend around and say, I believe you, even though my brain and my body are telling me something completely different, that my way is freedom. I will accept that you have offered me a perfect Torah of liberty, just like the Apostle James said. So at the Feast of Shavuot, that's another type of resurrection. We're kind of getting resurrected from our own ideas of freedom and embracing his freedom in his word. So that's a, an important step. So here's kind of the, the puzzle. We're going to look at some texts that relate to the blowing of the trumpets. And it's going to sound like we only blow the silver trumpets. And we know they have to be blown at the new moons. We know they have to be blown at the feast and, and certain other occasions. The question might come in, if that's the case, then why do Jews blow the shofar? Why are you more likely to see a shofar than the silver trumpets at these special occasions? Well, we're going to try to unpack that for you so it's not so much of a mystery. But let's look at our texts that do call for the trumpets. Uh, Leviticus 23-24 says, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, that's the Feast of Trumpets, you shall have a rest a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So we're going to look at what is it a remembrance of? Hint, hint, Passover, right? Numbers 10.2 says, Make yourself two trumpets of silver, of hammered work. You shall make them. And you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camps set out. Okay, another purpose. Not just to mark the feasts, but also um, to, to bring the congregation in, to bring them into assembly. And then when it's time for the assembly to move, you would blow the trumpets again and they would know it's time to go. Right? If they couldn't see the cloud and they couldn't see the ark moving, maybe they could hear the, the trumpets blowing. Numbers 10.10. 10. It says, Also, in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts, and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. Um, well, of course, the, the practice here, it's, it's naming these, these times specifically. And we can tell from the context, it does pertain to community sacrifices, which would have been in the tabernacle or the mishkan or in the temple the mikdash, when they're offering their burnt offerings. They're supposed to blow the trumpets uh, at the appointed feasts. They're supposed to blow it on the first of the month and even over the burnt offerings, right? And the sacrifices of the peace offerings. This is how we know that it needed to be blown in the tabernacle or the temple because this is where the offerings are offered. It says, this is also going to be a reminder before your God. This is going to help him remember. It's not like he forgets the way we do. But at times it feels like he moves away a little bit. You've probably been through that um, in your own walk where you felt like, well, is he listening? Has he moved away? And other times you feel him very close. 
Um, he's always there. He's never asleep. We can be assured of that. We don't need to wake him up with the horn, right? We don't need to set an alarm on our cell phone. He doesn't go to sleep. He never slumbers. We do. And often that, that sense of he's not close, um, it has to do with appointed times. It talks in scripture. It says, may my prayer to you, O Lord, be at the favorable time. In other words, there's in the universe, in the way that he has created the universe and the gates of heaven and so forth, he can always hear your prayer of repentance. But for some prayers, there is a favorable time of remembrance where, where the, the two of us connect with our remembrance, us of the miracles of the past. And then he remembers the promises he made concerning uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob about the inheritance that would be given to their children, an inheritance of resurrection and reinstatement in the Garden of Eden. So the shofar is going to mark these special occasions. And as we look at, at the text we just read, what seems to uh, kind of have something in common here is it doesn't say shofar. It doesn't say yovel. It doesn't matter. We're going to look at why it doesn't matter. Because if you blow the trumpets, then it's assumed that along with the trumpets, you're also going to be blowing the shofar for all these occasions that those scriptures list. Right? So, and this is often, um, again, if we can't read the Hebrew, there's a little bit of a disadvantage because often an English translator will try to help us. Um, by using maybe a different word or a more common word. And they might think, well, they don't know that Hebrew word. I'm just going to translate it as, as something else. Uh, so just learning how to use a simple concordance sometimes will clear up lots of misunderstanding. And if, if we read the, the text in English just in a very simple way, in our mind, it's only the silver trumpet that needs to be blown on the new month and the feasts and these particular occasions. But then we say, but why are the Jews blowing shofars on these occasions? If the text says silver trumpets, then why are they doing this? Well, this again, if we learn how to use our concordance and learn a little bit of Hebrew, we can figure it out. That Perhaps the understanding was, based on the experience at Mount Sinai, the shofar would always be blown on these occasions. Because at Mount Sinai, the Torah, not just the Ten Commandments, but Moses is going to download all the commandments. Right? So this shofar will always symbolize his word. And if we are obeying his word, why not celebrate it with the original Yovel? The, the silver trumpets are kind of added. Um, and, and sometimes it'll seem like that. If we assume something already, then we wouldn't see the silver trumpets as being adversarial to the blowing up the shofar. Uh, but where we're only reading silver trumpets, where we don't have that background and we don't have that context, we would say, well, it's only silver trumpets. So he, he, this kind of shows you that the practice was in place. The assumption was in place. The shofar would be blown just like at Shavuot. Psalm 81.3, our English translation says, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. All right, new moons start the month, but then new moons also start the month of Nisan, the month of Passover. So we need to know the beginning if we know which day to slaughter the lamb and the days of unleavened bread. In the fall, if we don't know the beginning of the seventh month, then we won't know that it's the Feast of Trumpets and to celebrate for two days. And that means it's going to be very difficult to count toward Yom Kippur. Um, you know, we might have to wait until Sukkot till we see that full moon and say, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe we messed up a day here. Um, but by putting both of those in there, saying at the new moon, at the full moon, he's saying it's important to blow it on the new moon, and you're going to blow it again on the full moon, which would be mid-month. When the month is full, of course, that is going to be mid-month. And so you'll have certain feasts that are marked by the beginning of the month, 
and then others that you know will come at the full moon. Um, of course, unleavened bread, it's going to come at the, the full moon. Uh, Sukkot, it's going to come at the full moon. So it says trumpet. Does it really say trumpet? No, it doesn't really say trumpet. It says shofar, the Hebrew word shofar for the yovel, for the ram's horn. And so this is an a, a incident of an English translator trying to help us, but actually covering up the vital information we need to help us put the two texts together and understand what's happening and what's expected. And so we don't want that to be hidden from us. You can go back very easily into a, a concordance. You can look up that particular word there for trumpet and find out what it is. It might be a trumpet, chatzotrot, or it might say shofar or yovel, the ram's horn. Um, so it pays to investigate beyond just the, the simple English text if it's something that matters to us. And, and to me, that matters. If it's so important, we have to be doing it at these important times. Yeah, I'm going to investigate that. I'm going to see what the Hebrew says. Um, what the text, I don't think, really does help us figure out, at least easily, is why both? If it was assumed the shofar would be blown, then why are the trumpets at it? And if the trumpets are there, how are we supposed to know about the shofar? Other than just keep reading, right? Um, I think it could be, and, and now we're into the territory of would be, could be, so don't sign my name to any of this. I just want to think out loud and, and show you a process. When something doesn't really come together as neatly as you want it to, it's an invitation to start thinking of explanations that will take you through some of the other scriptures. It doesn't mean you have to decide on one today, right? You can wait on new information. There will be new information coming as long as you keep studying the word. Um, but with both silver trumpets, let's say those are two witnesses, but a shofar, that would be a third witness. In scripture, it says, out of the mouth, where's the mouth? Well, your mouth goes here, and then the air of your mouth goes out there. Out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And so with the blowing of the silver trumpets and the shofar, we are establishing these particular occasions of the the new month, the feasts, the moving of the camp, the assembly of the leaders, the, the burnt offerings and so forth. And of course, they would blow the, the trumpets and the, uh, the shofar every day in the temple because every day you had sacrifices going up. So the shofar was a common sound coming out of the temple. Um, outside of the temple, not so much. Um, People who aren't Jewish tend to just blow shofars anytime they want to. Uh, they kind of blow with the wind. But if you listen, when Jews do the shofar, they do it at particular times. Of course, the times that we're talking about, for sure. Um, they'll blow it during the month of Elul. Uh, of course, they're going to blow it for Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, or Yom HaKippurim, for sure. Uh, but just random blowing on Shabbat, they don't do that. There is a particular practice. Uh, and so, you know, if you're blowing yours whenever you want to or you're practicing whenever you want to, you know, have a blast. Teach yourself. But if you were in a Jewish community, there would be a, a little more, I don't want to say discipline, a little more structure. And when they blow the horn, and within that very structure, you can kind of identify when and why and what's going on. Um, like, for instance, if you were to hear the shofar for an entire month, in your mind, like, okay, this is the month of Elul. I know exactly when this is. Um, at any rate, it gives us the two or three witnesses. We've got two speaking trumpets, and we have at least one speaking shofar. And what does this do? It validates his word. It says, these are the commandments you've given me at Mount Sinai. 
And these trumpets and this shofar, they validate everything you said. It's just like saying all over again, we will do and we will hear. We agree. Using your mouth, it's, it's wordless, but there are words that come out of that shofar. Um, we don't have time to pursue that rabbit trail in, in this program, but eventually understanding the tongues of men and angels goes back to the shofar. It really does, because it goes back to Mount Sinai. So um, what else can it represent? You can probably think up some other things that having the trumpets and the shofar together would represent. Um, what about silver trumpets as the witness of heaven and earth? Or what about the silver trumpets representing the voice of heaven and the shofar, which was attached to an animal at one time, <laughs> very land-based, what if this more earthy shofar represents the witness of the earth with the witness of heaven? What if it's the two comings of Messiah from heaven and then our answer of the shofar from the earth? See how you can kind of go back through biblical history and as you speculate, you're not forming a doctrine. You don't have to do that. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to anybody else either. But it helps you take your tour and start to put together some of the things you know about Scripture. Rather than worrying about what's the one answer, think of all the possible answers. You'll have a blast, and so will your kids, right? So this shofar can symbolize, symbolize a lot of different things in tradition. Uh, of course, the Jewish sages have been at this well over 3,000 years, and they know Hebrew much better than we do. So they've had plenty of time to think about this and to bounce some ideas off of one another based on the, the texts that they read. And they've made a lot of associations to the blowing of this shofar. And they might sound a little fantastic to us, but I think in most cases, if not all cases, everything I've read that they've written about this shofar, the New Testament scriptures bear it out. It's as if the New Testament scriptures expect us to already know those traditions about the shofar. So let's go back in our story. We're just getting the fundamentals down about the shofar. So if we want the fundamentals here, let's go back to Abraham, right? Father Abraham, he, he's, he sent us a lot of information through the ages. We know the, the greatest sacrifice of Abraham. Remember, you have to blow the shofar, you have to blow the trumpets over your sacrifices, your peace offerings, your burnt offerings, your olah offerings. Um, and an olah offering is sometimes translated out as burnt offering, uh, but it, it actually means olah, it means to go up. It's a going up offering. There's a lot of symbolism of the resurrection in that, by the way. And so Abraham is called to sacrifice Isaac as a Ola going up offering. He's a type of the Messiah. Uh, even the ram in the thicket is going to be a type of the Messiah. You say, wait a minute, you nail that down. You decide who that is. Which one of those is Messiah? Just kind of ride with it. Say, yeah, I can learn something from Isaac, and I can learn something from the ram in the thicket being offered as a substitute for Isaac. There's more than one explanation because he wants us to teach us multiple ways, maybe out of just one symbol. So Abraham offers Isaac on Mount Moriah. And of course, we know this was thought to, to be the exact mountain that became the temple mount in Jerusalem, that Isaac was being offered in the exact spot of the altar uh, there on the temple mount. We know that figuratively speaking, and New Testament scriptures bear this out, uh, figuratively speaking, Isaac was resurrected. And then Abraham looks over, he sees the ram caught in the thicket, and the ram takes his place. Um, and it's, again, traditionally thought that the two horns of the ram became 
to shofarot. To shofarot. That's plural. Shofar is singular. Shofarot is plural. If I blow one shofar by myself, but if I'm in an assembly on Rosh Hashanah or Yom HaKippurim, there might be many people who blow many shofarot. Right? So these two horns, we don't know where this guy's other horn is. I mean, it could be halfway across the world somewhere. Uh, I don't I guess they're numbered and signed, right? Uh, at any rate, and we appreciate his sacrifice, by the way, to give us uh, something to look at, uh, something to blow for these particular occasions. Um, maybe that in itself represents a sacrifice because, you know, you're going to do something with the animal. Uh, but those two horns of the ram caught in the thicket, one of those horns is said to represent the last trump of Rosh Hashanah. Now when I say Rosh Hashanah, don't trip. You say, wait a minute, you said Feast of Trumpets before. Yeah, I did. I did. Same feast. Uh, if you're in a Jewish community, they're going to call it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, or actually the, the turn or the change of the year. right? Because Hashanah, Shana is a year, but it also means a change. And so where the Torah calls it the turn of year, the year, uh, or the going out of the year. They'll call it Rosh Hashanah, just like in the book of Ezekiel, which says, really, it's the beginning of the change of a new year. It's the beginning of the change for those going free in the Jubilee. So they'll call it Rosh Hashanah. Uh, other congregations, they might call it the Feast of Trumpets. Some people might call it Yom Teruah, the day of blowing. If you're reading literature about it, you might see it called the hidden day, the day and the hour that no man knows, the day of the awakening blast. I think there's more nicknames for the Feast of Trumpets than any other feast. So one of those horns from the ram caught in the thicket was thought to be the, the last trump of the Feast of Trumpets. And then we know 10 days later, there is Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonements. On the Day of Atonement, they blow the great trump. So we think the last would be last, but that's not true. It's the last is first in that order and then great. Think of it like this. It, it, sometimes we get confused when we put, um, I guess, uh, quality with number. Yeshua is asked, what's the greatest commandment? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel. But what is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. But if you put the greatest with the first commandment, they're both pretty much saying the same thing, right? Okay, same thing with these two horns. They came from the same animal. And so what connects these ten days? These two feasts, the Feast of Trumpets and Yom HaKippurim. So it's two aspects of the same animal, so to speak. So you've got the last trump that's blown at the beginning of the month, the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, you'll blow the great trump. Not a hugely different message. Right? This one lets you get ready. It's reminding you that last chance coming up. And then when you hear the great trump, you're like, oh my goodness, gates are closing. Got to run, got to run, got to repent, got to repent. If you haven't already. Hopefully you took care of that way back there at Shavuot. It's uh, traditionally one way of looking at this is if you repented at Shavuot when this Yovel was originally blown, if you repented at Shavuot, then you haven't really changed your character in between then and the Feast of Trumpets. And so, yes, you will heed that last trump, but your name is already inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life. When the last trump is blown, it's more for the benefit of those who have fallen asleep in their faith. They have departed from the way. Uh, they're missing the mark. They, they have some bent places, really, that need to, to be straightened out. They need to bow to his will. And so the last trump is more for their benefit to warn them 
wake up. If you thought God was asleep, you got another thing coming. He was not asleep. But if you want him to draw closer to you, then you're the one that's going to have to wake up. So you've got 10 days. Better sooner than later, when you hear the last trump, don't wait till you hear the great trump. That's, that's the wrong way to think about it. Because when the great trump blows, everything's going to be sealed up. Oh, that 10 days, it's all going to be sealed up and the gates are going to close. So the idea here is Isaac's resurrection, um, which, by the way, every year at the Feast of Trumpets in the synagogues, what is the text that they will read? To celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, it's called the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Again, because here's another type of resurrection. On the Feast of Trumpets, it's thought that the body of Messiah will rise. So you say, no, wait a minute. You said Passover is associated with resurrection, and then you said Shavuot is associated with resurrection, and now you're telling me the Fall Feasts are associated with resurrection, and that's exactly what I'm telling you. He doesn't want us to lose that idea all throughout the seven feasts. Uh, that might be one reason he says, pray that your flight be not in winter, because that is not a season of the feasts. From Passover to Sukkot, this is your season of feasts. So the, the resurrection of Isaac traditionally provided the shofar, or the shofarot, um, for the resurrection of the dead in Messiah. Right? So that's, I just think that's pretty cool, guys. Um, if we think of Abba is a good father. A good father doesn't make it hard for his children to learn. He makes it as easy as possible for his children to learn, even though they're going to have to put forth an effort. You know what? You put a, forth a little bit of effort learning about the shofar, and all of a sudden, look how your horizons broaden in the kingdom and how much you understand about your salvation, your consecration, your sanctification, the redemption, your walk in faith and how it's preparing you and how that message of Messiah, it just runs through the whole thing. The whole thing. And so I hope this helps you a little bit. I know these are the fundamentals of the shofar, and I know there's some deeper mysteries there, and, and we'll work on some of those in a future program. But for now, if this is your first uh, glimpse into the world of the shofar, I hope it was as glorious for you as, as it was enjoyable for me. We'll see you next time.